indigenous people that uh, are up north in Canada. Uh, Annette, um, I'm sure must interact with these people, and we uh, also go up there a lot uh, into Canada, and we uh, work with some of the indigenous people there. And um, I want to acknowledge, you know, the First uh, Nations, the Métis, the Black uh, Foot people up there, uh, and a new uh, Cree. Uh, soon tonight, uh, Métis, uh, and, and a lot of these Native people are Edmonton and Saskatchewan, all the way to Nova Scotia. And, and, and so we interact, they come down to the, into the United States and we also go up north, the same thing, we go down south, we go into the international uh, uh, country and some of the star knowledge that we have shared and work with, uh, uh, we have worked with the Hawaiian uh, navigators and got on their canoes. And, and we worked with some of the astronomers from uh, New Zealand, the Maori, and some of the Aboriginal people in Australia. And so we have a uh, great uh, working relationship with these people. Um, uh, I want to just uh, highlight some things uh, that are uh, that are really different. Um, it's, when you go uh, talk about indigenous knowledge, astronomy, uh, there's some major differences. Uh, for example, uh, man and nature is not separate. They're 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 together. They're not separated in the indigenous uh, language and and uh, and then also everything is living. So uh, everything is living. It's a, uh, a system of interrelationship uh, with man as an integral part and a whole. And so- One minute, so, David, one minute. Uh, okay. And, uh, and then there's, you know, like separation of matter and spirit, separation of body and mind. And so there are some of these really major uh, differences. I just wanted to, you know, basically uh, highlight those those differences. So uh, when you work with indigenous people, you have to sort of like go into the mind of those people to really uh, communicate with them. And, uh, and then and, uh, the reverse is the same. When you go into the scientific mind, it's a different way of thinking about things. I'll stop here. <laughs> okay, great, great. And next we have, um, thank you, uh, Pilamia, David. Next we have uh, Nancy. Nancy, are you on the line? Nancy, oh, you might have to unmute yourself. Star six. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we got you, Houston. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, they have been there. Uh, good morning, everyone, because it's still morning where I live. I'm living in the San Juan Islands right now. Um, my name is Nancy Maryboy. I'm an affiliate professor with the University of Washington School of Ecological Sciences and Forestry. Uh, formerly taught a course in Indigenous Astronomy for NAU Department of Physics. Um, I'm also the president of the Inter uh, Indigenous Education Institute. The Indigenous Education Institute, or IAI, was created in 1995 as a nonprofit 503 institution with a mission to preserve, protect, and apply traditional Indigenous knowledge in a contemporary setting, that of Indigenous peoples today around the world. We've developed numerous projects that preserve traditional knowledge, protect the knowledge in terms of Indigenous protocol, and apply it to areas such as astronomy and other science disciplines. 
our work with IEI is focused on the boundaries between traditional indigenous science and Western science, sometimes places of tension, but also places where the most fruitful exchange of knowledge can take place. I am Cherokee and Diné Navajo, and IEI is an all-Native board and staff, so you can't get more grassroots than that. Um, a main focus of ours is Indigenous astronomy, and David, who is the Vice President of IEI, and I have been doing this work on Navajo astronomy for more than 25 years. I want to take a moment here to mention this is the generation to be acknowledged and supported. This generation uh, has speakers like David who are completely fluent in English and Navajo. Last generation, most of the knowledge holders were completely fluent in Navajo, but less so in English. And we fear that the next generation will be um, completely fluent in Navajo and English. So this is the generation where these things can be talked about at a deeper level, going all the way down to the subatomic level. Um, unlike other astronomy studies, um, you can't go to a library and read a book that's going to tell you all you want to know about astronomy or Astronomy 101 for the Navajo. It, they, it, the only ones that are available have been written by non-Native people, non-Navajos, and they are um, they, they are written through a Western perspective, whether it be Christianity or something similar. Um, they do not get to the heart of what makes Navajo astronomy astronomy. Um, we have discovered about 23 constellations and many patterns and um, many stories and uh, some of the deeper um, aspects of Navajo astronomy because we have hold the language. And we had to go way back in time to some ancient star maps. We also went into the future and used computers. We had a lot of help from different planetariums figuring out patterns and cycles. Um, we had many, many days of direct observation, morning and night, uh, from Saley, Arizona, Diné College, the, which is pretty much the center of the Navajo Nation. Wonderful, wonderful skies for star watching. Um, we used an ancient star map, and we were able to interpret it through the language. And that's what gave us an insight into finding these patterns and cycles. Now we look around and we find we are the elders. We used to go to elders and ask questions. Now we seem to be the elders and um, we've come up with some interesting discoveries that we are endeavoring to get back to the Navajo people. Uh, we're also working at flat screen, the virtual reality. Uh, we developed a uh, Navajo Sky uh, planetarium show, a digital show. Um, with the support of NASA. And David was the PI, which has never been done before, an actual, a native person being in charge of their own um, cultural investigation. So this was a first of many. Um, when you look at Navajo astronomy, you're looking at a cultural um, astronomy. You're looking at a worldview that is coloring the way that we look at the sky. It's highly based on language. It encompasses ways to live, to plant, to travel, and be in this world. It is passed down from families and clans through families and clans. And, um, and it's an oral history. I, I do want to mention that the um, ceremonies and songs themselves have aspects of not, you, you cannot make a mistake because that will invalid that can invalidate an entire ceremony. So this is the way we validate and um, um, make sure that the knowledge is correct that is being passed down. Um, the study of indigenous astronomy, in our case Navajo astronomy, calls for different protocols, different research methods, different validations different uses of research material, different kinds of knowledge sources, including dreams, intuition, visions, animals, plants, fish, birds, place, and time, and different ways of knowledge transmission that are common in academia. One challenge was to position our research within the accepted Western constructs, while at the same time retaining the holistic interdependencies 
values of reciprocity and stewardship of native science. As our research continued over many years, we found um, that precisely locating our ancestral knowledge base on the Nebakea, Navajo land, using the Navajo language, and stressing the importance of observation-based, place-based research, we were able to avoid some of the more common academic traps, which often lead to marginalization of Native thinking at the university graduate levels. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about Navajo Native languages. Native languages are fundamentally different from Indo-European languages, such as English, French, and Spanish. Native languages reflect a worldview of motion, of process, and relationship. Their languages are verbs, not static languages with noun dependencies. How well suited they are to discuss, to discuss astronomical entities and how to live the cosmic order. They're holistic. They can hold relational paradox and can be used in complex discussions of quantum theory. In fact, in the Navajo language, we can talk about waves and particles as different and at the same, same time similar, as many and at the same time one. The Navajo language, we would say, is a quantum language, and Navajo astronomy is a quantum astronomy. I want to uh, take a few minutes here to talk about protocol. Um, this is really important for any of you um, that uh, are from planetariums and are thinking about incorporating indigenous uh, sky stories and knowledge into your presentations. Um, tribes such as the Diné in Arizona, Utah, and Mexico, we have strict protocols involving when stories of the sky can be told. For example, winter stories are closely linked to cosmic cycles of the sun and moon. Generally speaking, one only tells these stories from late September to mid-March. When the first thunder of spring is heard, it is announced all over Navajo land by radio, newspaper, or word of mouth. That is the time plants awaken and animals come out of hibernation, having been stirred by the energies of the thunder and other signs. It is the time at which winter stories can no longer be told. This protocol is extremely important to be followed if a planetarium plans to show Navajo stories. There is, however, one time around the summer solstice when some of these stories may be shared for educational purposes. If the protocol is not followed, a planetarium could be severely criticized by local Navajos. And we know there are Navajos in just about every town in the United States. There are lots and lots of Navajos. Um, information can also be restricted by gender, phenomena. For example, we have taboos around visit viewing eclipses. Time of day, location, or other factors that must be taken into consideration. Finally, it is critical that Indigenous people are able to speak for and about Indigenous knowledge. The collaborating community must give clear permission about how their knowledge is presented especially if the planetarium educators are non-Indigenous or not from the community sharing that knowledge. Examples of centering Indigenous voices may include naming specific elders who shared knowledge, record their voices or videos so they can be there, deli deliver remotely, like we're doing today, or nominating an appropriate person to deliver content if an Indigenous staff member is unavailable. One if minute, the planetarium Nancy. Has, thank you. If the planetarium has no indigenous presenters or educators, significant efforts should be made to correct this. Programs have been developed at astronomy-related education and outreach facilities around the world. And um, I can name one in particular, Sydney Observatory. I think I'll stop now. And thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and an honor to speak to you today. Miigwech, um, Pilamia. Thank you so much, Nancy. So um, the next uh, elder we have is here with us um, virtually because he's at uh, um, Wasipi Ceremony, Sundance Ceremony um, with the stars. So um, uh, this is Wilford Buck, who's an Inanu elder, uh, fantastic guy, a colleague, 
and he asked us to play uh, his uh, video. So. So this story concerns the asterism known as the uh, Big Dipper. For a lot of First Nations people, this story represents various animals. And the foremost among them is the Big Bear. And then uh, the Cree language is called Mistamasqua. The legend talks about what the uh, wages of being a bully are, and how even the, uh, the littlest of animals can bring down the most ferocious. The way the story goes is that uh, long ago there was a uh, big bear which roamed the country. And this bear was the hugest, of course, biggest, the meanest, and therefore it did what it wanted to do. It preyed on everybody, every spiritual being on the face of Mother Earth. And this went on for years and years. The bear stole winter supplies, ripped up camps, killed spiritual beings, killed the animals, killed humans. And so one day, all these beings had a big meeting and they decided that they were tired of being afraid of this bear. And so it was decided that the bear would have to go. Seven hunters were chosen, seven of the best trackers and seven of the best shots. Small birds were sent to do away with this bear. They went hunting for the bear, but the bear was forewarned by a raven and a crow that there were hunters after him. And so the bear, upon hearing that he was being hunted, took off and the, uh, the birds chased him. And the way the elders say is that the chase was on and it went around the world four times. It uh, circled the globe. And on the fourth time, they were going so fast that they came up over the horizon and they flew into the air. This happened to be just around September, October. And as they flew into the air, the bear saw that the hunters were gaining on him and he was getting tired. So he turned and he faced his attackers, his hunters. And just as he did that, uh, one of the lead birds got a shot and mortally wounded that bear. So that bear was bleeding profusely as he stood and faced his hunters. And he shook just like a dog shake when it's wet. And as he shook, all the blood he was bleeding fell to the earth and landed on all the broadleaf plants. So that's why our elders say that in, uh, around September, October, all the leaves change color because of the blood of that bear. They also go on to say that when that bear shook, a droplet of blood hit that lead bird, the one that shot the, the bear right in the chest. And he, today he has a red breast. And for the Cree people, they call that uh, that bird pee pee tell, the robin. And that's why the robin today has a red breast. And so they got rid of that bear to forever warn everybody about the wages of being a bully, of abusing your power. That big bear was put in the sky. And also to honor those seven birds, they placed those birds in the sky right in front of that big bear. That lead bird, PPHL, is the brightest star in that uh, that constellation. And that uh, PPHL, the robin, was also given a special egg. And that egg represented the color of the sky. And on that egg, there were speckles to represent Atagosa, the stars. And that's why our elders uh, always warned the children never to uh, harm a robin, because uh, it's a special bird, that's a creator's bird. And that is the legend of uh, Mr. Masqua, the big bear. Okay, so thank you, Wilford, and thanks for praying for us, all your hard prayers at Sundance. So thank you, Prilamia. Right, next, we have Caillou from uh, Imaloa. So Caillou, are you on the line? Looks like Caillou is in the room and I'm trying to get them to unmute. There they go. Yeah, okay. I hear her. Four minutes is good. Yep. Aloha. Mahalan we loa ya oko po ki hui ana ki wa oho no ka iki mura. Uh, good morning, 
Good afternoon, good evening um, to all of you on the call. My name is Kaiu Kimura. I'm the director of the Inua Astronomy Center, which is at Hilo, Hawaii. Uh, I first of all want to say mahalo nui, um, much appreciation to all those who made this session possible. Uh, Annette, for pulling all our partners together, um, all of our partners, it's always such an honor to be on call um, with everybody on this panel uh, and to the entire uh, IPS Ohana, our family, uh, really appreciative um, to have this time with you and just to share a little bit about what we do. Um, so like both David and Nancy um, were, as we can see, our, our language is such an important um, and integral part to who we are. Uh, as Native peoples of our land, as non-Native people, it's how we communicate, it's the code through which we share, connect, learn, absorb, um, and explore. Uh, and so for us here in Hawaii, our native language, our Hawaiian language is on a journey back to renormalization um, in our own homeland. And uh, I got involved with Umi Loa, not because I have a big background in formal astronomy, <laughs> but my background is more in Hawaiian language and the revitalization of our language. And so uh, it was a great opportunity um, for members of our Hawaiian community to join up with members of our local astronomy community to co-create the space that we now call Inua Astronomy Center of Hawaii. Um, it was challenging just given some of the differences in worldviews and perspectives and values. But at the end of the day, uh, I think what really brought Inua together was our language uh, and the fact that we had committed to a bilingual uh, science center, uh, which forced the conversation um, around understanding each other's perspectives so that we could create a fully bilingual experience. Um, and so we opened in 2006, and I'm proud to say that since from that time till now, uh, we continue to be a fully bilingual center. Uh, and we are taking it a, 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 a another notch up. And um, so this screen that you see, Po Niwa Ena, I'm sure many of you, all of you probably right, have heard about this discovery, Po Niwa Ena, and its name is unusual, um, but not to us here in Hawaii. So one of our new um, journeys is, is a brand new type of partnership between our Hawaiian language speakers and those who are actively researching um, through Mauna Kea and Haleakala uh, astronomical observatories and we are engaging in ways that I think are exciting um, and continue to advance the mission of Umi Loa, which is bringing our native culture, our native language together with the modern pursuit of astronomical research in ways that engage and benefit and inspire in particular our next generation of leaders. And so um, Poniwa Ena is a result of a partnership between all of the observatories here in Hawaii our Institute for Astronomy, which is a part of the University of Hawaii, uh, as well as Umi Noa and our College of Hawaiian Language, which is a part of the University of Hawaii as well. So we all come together and um, with the help of our friends uh, in the astronomy community, identify some of the major discoveries being made here in Hawaii. Uh, we then, before they're published, um, we then take that research and we, we, we bring native speakers um, ranging, ranging from youth all the way through to uh, elders. Um, and in particular, uh, those who are educators who are working with our native youth and um, through our native language. Okay, that's not all the time we have, sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. and that <laughs> resulted in Tonyua Edo, but great partnership um, between our native speaking and astronomy uh, speaking communities here. And we're happy to share that with the world. Mahalo. Oh, mahalo, Pilamia. Okay. Okay, next we have Milagros. So that um, just a short uh, four minutes and thank you so much for joining us. Gracias. Thank you, Annette. Malo Hi everyone, I am Milagros Vargas. I am director of uh, Cancun Planetarium and then director of Frutos Digitales, a consultant in science communication. Many thanks to the IPS, especially to Mark and Annette uh, for their enthusiasm and support. I am very, very happy and honored to be on this panel and with uh, such uh, outstanding speakers who have spent years dedicating uh, themselves to echoing indigenous astronomy. Uh, 
um, today more than ever, uh, we need to return to the values of our native peoples. I am descent of the Mayan people, and since I was a child, I was surrounded by Mayan universe, not only because of the proximity of the um, archaeological sites, but also of its people's books, myths, and Mayan legends. However, I also saw things that no had, had no relationship with who we are. In Mexico, um, I think many times others tell our stories, so I needed to tell my own story and share part of my uh, Mayan legacy. That's why I decided to produce the Fulham shows, Mayan Archaeastronomy Observer of the Universe, and Mexica Archaeastronomy Between Space and Time. Both were very successful, not only in Mexico, but around the world. Only Mayan archaeastronomy is present in more than uh, 250 planetariums in 43 countries. And it, uh, it was translated in 13 languages, including the Maya. Um, many of these uh, translations were the initiative of some colleagues from other planetariums, and some planetariums use this uh, full dome show as a pre pretext to do activities around um, archaeoastronomy, such a uh, um, photography exhibition of Mayan archaeological sites, um, pre Hispanic uh, music concert, conference on cultural astronomy, workshops on Mayan numbering or calendar, among others. All these shows, uh, uh, all these uh, movies shows the great interest uh, in learning more about our native peoples. I am very, very happy and proud to be an ambassador for my culture and to be with, um, with my colleagues today opening the way to indigenous astronomy, being this bridge between different realities and imaginary that promote understanding between us. I hope um, that this group continues to grow and strain as it has done so far. Thank you very much. Oh, gracias. Thank you. Um, you're right on time, even extra time. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, next we have uh, Yasmin. Are you on the line, Yasmin? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. You got. You have two minutes, and I'll I'll help you at the end. Okay, two minutes. Mari Mari Lamien, Mari Mari Compute, Inte Yasmin Kaditeo. Hello, everyone. My name is Yasmin Kaditeo. I am a physics educator from Chile, from the south of Chile, and I'm here today to talk a little bit uh, about Mapuche original people from the south of Chile. As you can see the map here, uh, we have South America. So the orange color and um, that it says Walmapu, that, is, that belongs to the Mapuche territory. Mapuche is not only from Chile, it's also um, with Argentina. Mapuche, we speak Mapudungun, which Mapudungun is the speak of the earth. Can we go to the next one? Thank you. So I have another um, map here, a little more focus on Chile ter uh, Chilean territory. And we have the territory Latkenche, Las Pehuenche. And in Mapudungun, um, we talk, um, the words are combined. For example, when we say Latkenche, Latke means the people live next to the ocean, and Che is people. So that means people from the ocean. Uh, for example, next to the, um, to the mountains, we have Pehuenche. So that is the people that live next to the, to the mon mountains because uh, pewen is the fruit that comes from a, from a tree that belongs to the mountains. And che, it is uh, people. So it's the people that comes from the mountains. Mapuche um, is another original people that has been impacted by astronomy, but it's not really, it's not known so much like another uh, original communities. Next one, please. Um, we, we have the sun 
uh, the moon, and also the eclipses, there have meanings, and there's those meanings has to impact the way how a Mapuche community has developed the culture. Uh, the sun we call it Antu, uh, the moon Kuyen, and also the eclipses are very important because uh, everything for us is about uh, energy. And when there is an eclipse, uh, we say there is an energy between the good and the bad, they're fighting together. A uh, long time ago, there were no watches, so people didn't know how to measure the time. So, of course, the uh, um, um, people used to look at the sky and try to see uh, how much longer it will take to the night to come on, in how much longer the sun will rise. So they used to uh, look at the planets and they say the star that brings the down, they call to Venus or Jupiter or the start that bring the night when they see, they see Jupiter in their evening phase. Okay, we got to wrap it up. You got a 10 second summary? Yes. And so Mabuta astronomy uh, is being impacted for the orientation, travel time, harvest, and organization for the state of the year. Uh, you can see these pictures right here, and that belongs to my community, which is in Chillán Viejo. Um, and we try, we have a community that try to spread the word about Mapuche people and try to let them know that it's important to know your roots. Okay, and, uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you, Hilamia. Okay, really appreciate it. Sorry to have to keep it short. It's hard to keep it short, huh? Um, uh, do we have uh, Dwayne um, from Australia? Dwayne, are here. you? Oh, fantastic. Okay, all right. Hi, right, Annette. Thank you so much for inviting me and thanks everybody. It's uh, nice and very early here in Australia. Um, my name is Dwayne Hamacher. I'm uh, an associate professor of cultural astronomy at the University of Melbourne. And um, it's really fantastic to see all of the work that's happening here in Australia in regards to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander astronomy. Um, being from the US originally, it was quite a challenge for me uh, coming to Australia and learning about this. Um, I'm very happy that nowadays there's a whole new generation of Aboriginal students who are studying astrophysics and getting involved in rekindling uh, traditional knowledge across the country. Um, there's only one PhD qualified astrophysicist in Australia who's Aboriginal, so there's a huge gap that needs to be filled in this area. And that's something that these observatory and planetarium programs are helping us to achieve. Um, we have some excellent programs at the Brisbane Planetarium where we developed uh, Sky Lords, a very large indigenous astronomy um, exhibition that was, um, you know, I helped curate, but it features the voices and faces and knowledge of communities in the Torres Strait, the uh, Mary and Mary community in the east, um, the Wadaming community in the Northern Territory and the Gamilaroi people in Northern New South Wales. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity for the elders to come down and share their knowledge on a permanent scale. And we've got programs like uh, Nancy mentioned at Sydney Observatory um, where Aboriginal people are brought in um, to lead and, and guide the STAR programs. And now, of course, in Western Australia, we have some excellent planetarium and observatory programs that are being run um, by initiated by local uh, Noongar elders. So it's a fantastic way to see the, the way this, this content is being incorporated into planetariums and observatories across the country, as well as university subjects and education programs, such as our uh, coming Indigenous Astronomy subject at the University of Melbourne next year, which will feature quite a few Indigenous voices from around the world. Okay, Dwayne, we better stop there because we got two minutes for two more speakers. Awesome. Thank you. Kilamia. Great job, Dwayne. Okay, Kahu. Hey, uh, Kahu Ratai, are you on the line? Oh, yes. Okay. I'm here. <laughs> Sorry, we're uh, just to give us. Yep. Kia mai rā no tata kato, um, tēnei te mihi ki uh, kaitau ngā tōkana ko a whāraki hi a tātou, kōrero ki a tātou, um, tēnei te mihi tautoko. Um, ko te kā rātou pēntu kuingua, huri whakaeke mai ngā koe. Kia ora everyone, I just want to start off by um, saying thank you and supporting all the words that have been spoken already by my elder siblings across the Indigenous nations of this world. And my name is Te Kau Rātou, and I just want to show these two pictures to make the point of how Indigenous astronomy and astronomy in general is actually very closely related to where you are on the land. Um, for us in the Southern Hemisphere, we get shown all these pictures and all these um, 
constellations that are constantly upside down, inverted, or representing the opposite time of the year. So when we've got like Aquarius in January, that's when we have our hardest drought. So we've got all these um, stories that are related to a place other than where we are on the land. And our Māori way of thinking about astronomy would be tuaki te rangi, tuaki te whenua, tuaki te moana, kārongo te pō, kārongo te ao, which is we weave in the signs from the sky to the signs of the land and the signs in the water as well. And that's our way of approaching astronomy is you don't just look at the stars, but you look at the trees that are flowering, the fish that are moving. And nothing <laughs> illustrates that better than Scorpius versus Te Matoa Maui, Maui's fish hook. Kia ora. Okay, okay. Kilamia, thank you. Jarita, are we, do you have you on the line for the grand finale, Jarita? And thank you, Kahu. Yes. <clears throat> Aloha, everyone. I'm Jarita Holbrook, and you may know me because I run the oral history project for the American Astronomical Society. And you may not know that I now live in Scotland because I always move around. Um, so I'm descended from enslaved Africans and American, and I'm part First Nation. Um, but you may know me because I am an expert on African indigenous astronomy. And you see here on the left, uh, my book, African Cultural Astronomy. And then I have my articles down at the bottom. I'm forever creating new resources on African and indigenous astronomy, bringing together um, information from scholars who's gone before me in the field, as well as going out and collecting new field research. And the other part you may know of me for is actually my engagement with diversity in astrophysics. And there's my two films that are available, one on Vimeo and one on amazon.com. So we have Hubble's Diverse Universe, which has been out for a while now, since 2012 and Black Suns, which has been out since 2017. It was out in time for the Great American Eclipse. So you can find out more about me. I'm not shy. I'm all over the internet, but thank you for your time. <laughs> okay, hey, Lamia. Great job, Charita. Okay, and just to wrap it up, um, here's some of my work and uh, I'll just keep it short. You can look me up. Native Sky Watchers is my main uh, grassroots revitalization effort for Ojibwe and Dakota Lakota. Um, in closing, I just want to say another thanks for the IPS for giving us this time to really have a voice here in revitalization of our own indigenous star knowledge in our communities and wellness. Um, I just want to say that we have a really great publication as a part of this conference and that will be a peer reviewed journal article coming up. So again, thank you everyone. Um, Pilamia Megwich. That's it. All right, thank you so much. That was amazing. And um, if anyone is wanting to know more, they can put any questions that you might have in the chat, or if you're following along on Facebook, you can put them in the comments there or reach out to the presenters afterwards. The Indigenous Astronomy panel does have an impressive 16 page write up available on the <laughs> IPS website. If you wanna check it out, I already put the link in, but it's getting pushed up by all these amazing thank yous um, to our amazing presenters.